Hey, um, Web Services and Coco. My name's Tim Raphael. I'm from Murdoch University, and here are my Twitter Twitter handle and my consulting email address. Um, I'll give them to you later on. But today, Web Services and Coco. Um, I'll have a look at um, a bit of both, how they work together, how you can use them, and there'll be plenty of code. The two presentations I've seen so far have been uh, light on in terms of code. Tim's was nice because it some lovely little CSS and stuff you don't normally see much, but I give you some good examples here. So, it's sort of obligatory. Um, what we'll cover? Oh, about me first. Um, I am, yeah, I'm Tim Raphael, Murdoch University, but I am finishing off a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Network Security at Murdoch University, and I work as a network engineer for a tier two managed service provider, routing, switching, wireless security, that kind of thing. But in my spare time and my hobby time, I'm an iOS, Mac OS X developer. And I've got a particular interest in education apps, um, specifically targeted to the education sector. The couple that I've done so far have been released under enterprise licenses. So, what we'll cover. Um, we will look at what is a web service and why you would w use web services. What are the positives and benefits of them? We'll look at the different technologies that are used inside of web services, um, whether it be coding technologies or data representation technologies. Uh, and I'll do some quick demos with popular web services. In our case, I'll use Twitter. Um, the bulk of the presentation will be how do you make your own web service? I'll be using PHP and web services with Coco. How do you get your iOS and Mac OS S apps to talk to your web service? And I'll show you a design pattern that worked really well for me. Might not work for you, but I'll show you what I've learned. So, what is a web service? Primarily, a web service uh, provides an interface to some sort of data repository. You're giving the developer or some sort of client application access to your data in a controlled means. So you use your web service to control access to search, update, and delete, if you wish, data in your store. So a web service can slap onto any type of database or other application. It's a very, very nifty tool to have and get your head around. It is also stateless. Ah, go back. It's also stateless, um, unlike logging into Facebook or logging into Twitter where it maintains your authenticated session and knows who you are. A web service, each action with the web service must be atomic. If you request some information, you have to request the information, receive it back, and that's the end of the communication. That's just one of the rules of using a web service. That's the way they work. So no sessions, no cookies. You can do authentication, but you'd have, to do, you'd have to authenticate on each request by sending some sort of token. The reason, um, this simplifies it, and it makes it really, really easy to scale. Why would you use a web service? Um, they use HTTP and HTTPS. They're a web service. Um, this means that it's a very well-known and simple, when I say simple, it can go to the nth degree of complexity, but it's basic. Um, protocol is very simple. You ask for something, you get it back, or you send a request and it does something. It's very easy and very easy to develop and support because it's so widely used. Um, also, when I say it's widely used, it's platform independent, so iOS, Mac OS X, Windows, Linux, and even fridges. Has anybody got a fridge with the touch screen on the front? Anybody? They sort of came, they went, they had a web browser, and they sort of died. I wouldn't mind one, to tell you the truth. Um, the other reason is they're incredibly scalable. For those that have had anything to do with Apache before, you can put a load balancer in front of a farm of Apache servers, and it just uh, randomly splits the request across your farm. So if you have a very popular web service, and you have your app, and you've got thousands and thousands of people using it, you can very easily load balance um, requests to a web service. So, web service technologies. 
Um, Server-side scripting makes up the most part of it. Um, PHP is the big one. I like it. It looks like C. It functions like C. And I'm a systems programmer to start with. Um, you've also got a couple of other options. I've heard a lot about Ruby on Rails, but I've never uh, tried it myself. Anybody had any experience with Ruby before? You like it? No? OK. One person's opinion. <laughs> I never looked at it, but I've heard it's promising. Um, storage, data storage. As I said, you can slap a web service onto pretty much anything as long as you can get your server side language to talk to it. So you've got various different types of databases. I put PostgreSQL up there. Yeah, PostgreSQL up there if you really, really must. I don't like it at all. But it seems to work. Um, as long as you can store data in it and you can use a language to get the data out, you can put a web service in front of it. Moving on, data representation languages. Now, this is a critical part of web services because you have to communicate data back to the user somehow. Uh, using something like XML or JSON allows you to uh, give a response to the user's request and have it very easily parsable. I, you can pull a data structure out of it and make meaning of the data very easily. I'll get on a bit later into XML and JSON and how they can be used and how you can parse them with Cocoa. Um, and REST. Now, you might have heard REST before. In the last couple of years, it's become a bit of a buzzword in terms of web services. It's not a specification as such. It's more of a concept. Uh, it stands for representation, uh, sorry, representation state transfer. And it's more of an architecture for a web service. Um, and as I said, it's within the last couple of years, it's become more and more popular. But what REST uh, is based around is the idea of resources, using some sort of logical directory-like path to get access to a resource. Now, a resource can be anything. Don't think of a resource as in an HTML page or a PHP script. Think of it as uh, a logical piece of data. And you use this interaction with resources using URIs. Now, URI is only the bit after the main section of a website, so it's the forward slashes. You'll see in a minute what I mean by forward slashes and directory type structure. So here we've got a URL, um, but it's the bit after web service, and it's the forward slash API, forward slash company, forward slash employee, forward slash 123. Now, that isn't pointing to a file on that web server. There's no extension. But that section, if you look at it, company, employee, identifier. That has a logical structure. You'd think, hmm, OK. We're looking at employee with ID 123 that belongs to company. This is a very easy way of pointing to a piece of data um, and then doing something with it. So with HTTP, we've got four types of requests. Get, put, post, and delete. When you write a RESTful web service, it's each of these four methods that determines what you want to do at that, with that resource. So if you send a get, you're asking to fetch some information about it. And a delete, you're obviously asking to delete it. Put and post uh, are sometimes interchangeable, but generally you use put to create. You think in the context of an FTP server, you put onto there to transfer a file from local to remote. And post, you generally use to update data on the service. So if we have a look at these RESTful API calls, um, obviously it's a dummy website, but the first two are reasonably obvious in terms of what they're asking for. The top one is the same as the example on the previous slide, and the second one is company slash employees. So now I've used a plural instead of the singular form of employee. So logically, does anyone have a guess what I'm asking for there? No, employees, second, second one. All of them for that company. Pretty logical. The next four, if you look at uh, number three and number four, API company one, two, three, and API company one, two, three, same URI, but the method is different. The first one will give you the results back of company one, two, three. It'll tell you information about company one, two, three. 
and the fourth one will create company one, two, three. And that's the same with um, number five and number six, whereby you're posting or updating uh, an employee of company with the ID one, two, three, or deleting it. So it all depends on the method you use. HTTP response codes. You use these to report back to your user to indicate if the request was successful or not and what the reason it was for being successful or why it wasn't successful. What's the text that goes along with HTTP 200? Can anyone tell me? Okay, yeah, exactly. What about HTTP 404? I had a feeling you'd all know that one. What about 405? Anyone? Mm, not quite. Method not allowed. So say you're trying to delete a resource, but you want to protect that resource. You just send the user back, oh, you're not allowed to delete that. Say, trying to do a delete on slash API. You'd probably ignore that, but that'd be helpful to the client to say, you're trying to do something that I don't want you to. 201 is created. So if you do a put, because it's in the 200, all 200 codes are generally uh, all good, but 201 means you've created something. That's good to go off the end of a put. 204, anyone? Anyone? All right. Um, that's no content. So say you do a get on a company and you say employees of the company, you might not return any employees. So you re you'd return a blank document, but if you put that in the header, you know that it's blank for a reason. So this just gives some really good feedback. And these are all standard HTTP, re HTTP response codes. Very useful to use. So, you're probably wondering, how can I use all this theory? Let's start writing the bare bones of a web service that'll do these kind of things. It'll allow you to interact with a database. I'll continue with the, in company, with the company employees type example. It's a little boring. I oh, know, I'll do this first. Um, Twitter's API. Twitter gives you a RESTful API with a few extensions. Um, they use HTTPS, though there's no authentication on this particular part of the API. The reason they're using HTTPS is because you can uh, accept their certificate and then validate that you are actually talking to Twitter. That's the reason they're doing that. So this API uh, particular section is api.twitter.com. They ask you for the version, and it's the users section. So the resource we're looking for is users. Now, you can chuck some options on the end to filter it down. And these are your standard get options. So question mark parameter equals value. The two options available are user ID, which is a UID for the user, and it's a horrible string of numbers that no one can remember, or it's a screen name. So if I hit up that URL, which is asking for details about someone with the screen name Tim Raphael 215, yours truly. Um, nice little bit of cocoa there to keep you guys sort of interested in cocoa because I don't want you drifting off into Webland too much. That just basically puts the uh, return value of this um, API call into a string. Pretty straightforward. But what that outputs is this. I've truncated it. Tron yeah. I've terminated it near the bottom of the slide because it's about three or four pages long. All the details about me, my real name, um, what my tagline is, uh, my user ID, which you can see is the first option there. It's about a six or eight digit number. And it goes on and on and on. URL for my display picture, color of background on my Twitter, um, Twitter page, how many posts I have, how many followers I have, etc., etc., etc. But that's JSON because I asked for it with format.json. You can now parse that and use that information. So you'll find a lot of your Twitter apps, when you click on the user, or the native apps, when you click on the user, it's doing a call similar to that to get more information. So that's a, a real world use of uh, web services. So, how do you make your own? As I said, I'll use PHP because it's simpler. I'll go into more reasons in a second. Just a heads up, uh, here comes the code. Uh, if you weren't looking for a Cody type presentation, eh, might not be for you, but stick around anyway. 
uh, PHP web service. Um, use the HTTP response codes. They're your friend. They're standard. You might as well use them. They're easy to do. They're one line of code in PHP. Uh, use resource paths as identifiers for your logical data. Try your best to put it into a hierarchical structure. Most data is hierarchical. Um, if not, uh, you might want to use some other type of uh, method for accessing your through your API. This works best when it's hierarchical data, such as company, employee, company and employees. If you need to filter your results, use those additional question mark parameters at the end of your URLs. That allows you to pass in other filters like screen name in the case of Twitter. I couldn't just go api.twitter.com slash users and expect the information of all users to be returned. So, the reasons I'm using PHP, uh, it's OO, so there are some really nice built-in objects that allow you to connect to databases and parse out strings and URLs. Makes it really useful. As I said, it's a C-like syntax, so it's very easy to understand if you've done any sort of basic programming. And it's widely supported on a lot of web servers. So let's start some setup. Uh, first off, you're going to want to initialize your database connection whatever it may be, whether it be MySQL or SQLite as a file. And second thing you're going to want to do is grab your request method. That red might not be easy to read, I'm sorry, but it says request underscore method in that server variable. That'll tell you whether the user sent a get, a post, a put, or delete, and it will put it as a string. Second, you want to grab the request URI. Now, that will return the URI part of the URL. OK, I should first say there's some little bit of magic you've got to do to get a script like this to run. Because as I said before, there's no file extension at the end of your URL. So how does the web server know to respond with this script? You've got to do some funky redirections. With Apache, it's called mod rewrite. You've got to use, you've got to say any call, any request that comes to this server with the URL slash API slash, you've got to redirect to this script. Now, that doesn't modify the requesting URL or the URI. Um, those variables still remain the same. It's just this script gets to respond to it. Um, mod rewrites use quite a lot in forums to get those nice looking URLs and things like that. This is the sim similar idea. It took me a while to work it out, but it's about two lines in a mod rewrite. Anyway, you do a switch case on your server request method, and you set up methods to handle it accordingly. Really, this is trivial in terms of the logic of this. So the URIs, we need to somehow break down the path to work out what the user is actually asking for. Um, all I'm doing here is I'm parsing the URI as a URL because it comes in as a string. So this just gets PHP to identify it as a URL, and I put that into another string. And then I split it around the slashes, and I extract out the path parts. And so I put it into my path variable. I end up with an array, basically. These two URLs here, one's got parameters on the end, one doesn't. They're going to heed the same result. API is going to be element 0, and company is going to be element 1, simply. The parameters are ignored. So it's only the resource path we're looking for. Please keep in mind this code isn't. Uh, it's reasonably well structured, but it's no, by no means production ready. There's no error checking, nothing. This is simply to demonstrate the logic. So here, um, we're going to handle a get. So we're going to say, if path one equals companies, i.e. someone's gone slash API slash companies, API will be element zero. So companies will be element one. So if, if that's set, return all companies. Simple. You're going to want to do some error checking around that to make sure that element two, for example, is null or not set, and that there's no other get parameters pulled in there. And so you write a method that will return all companies. Well, most websites either have api.website.com or they use a slash API. It, in my case, because I'm using slash API to determine yes, you're hitting my, my web service API, it'll be element one, because element zero will always be API. I could have done a little bit of code previously to rip, rip that off and 
whatever, but the logic's still the same. Uh, two other requests, we're asking for the details of a specific company. So if path one equals company and path two uh, is not null, so it's actually set, return company with ID and you pass that in. And that function will go and look up your SQL database. It'll um, select all from companies where company ID equals and it will um, return you that information in whatever format it's set up to return it as, depending on what framework you use for connecting to a database. Second option here, I'm using parameters instead. So with this company ID structure, it's perfectly fine to use um, that top example where you've got a slash to, for the identifier, but if you had some really out there filter you wanted to run, you pull those in with the get, dollar underscore get, and the name of the variable. Really straightforward stuff, and you do that instead. I'm using the isSet method to check that that get variable is set. So that'll return true or false, depending on whether it's been passed in with the request. To return JSON from PHP, this is that lovely data representation language that's nice and fast and light and easy to, to parse. Um, I've got return all company, so I'm actually implementing this method for you, and I'm saying run your query, run your query against a database, and, and pull it out as an array. I'm using PHP data objects, or PDOs. They're really nice. You can bind your SQL query parameters in so you can mitigate SQL injection and all that kind of stuff with this. I haven't actually done any here because I don't have any parameters. I just want, um, I just want all the companies, so this is select all from companies. And then I've got a return JSON function. In that return JSON function, you're gonna to wanna to return 200 because it's succeeded. Obviously, you'll have some error checking to say whether it exists or not. You return 200, which means all is okay, here's your data. And then there's a built-in function into PHP called JSON encode. You give that an array of your information and it will encode it out for you. Really nice, really simple. And as I said, to return an HTTP uh, response code, it's one line. HTTP forward slash 1.0, 200, okay. You just substitute in the text there for your um, relevant response code. And this is what you'll get. In my case, there's only two companies, uh, one with ID one, one with ID two, and it returns the information. Now that's really easy, parse, really easy to parse. Just if you look at it from a logic perspective, everything's encapsulated in quotes. Uh, there's colons between the information, there's curly braces between each entity. Very straightforward. Um, I'll do a quick put example, and I promise you that's the end of the PHP. Um, so put's a little different. Uh, you can't pass in variables like you can with a get. There's no dollar underscore put in PHP. You've got to grab it from this funky PHP colon slash slash input stream instead, and you put that into a file. So in my case, I'm getting my path parts, so realizing that yes, that person is actually hitting API company one, two, three. Okay, does anyone remember what a put is for? The method put, what action would that end up in? Get, fetches, post, updates, delete, deletes, and put, creates, creates yeah. So here we're gonna create a company with ID one, two, three. So I parse it string file and basically the I'm talking about the fourth, fifth line there, parse string file, get content, PHP input, put vars. I'm just grabbing any variables that are in there because you, you parse them in, you, you know, sorry, you request them and you send them a different way. They're not in the URL like all the others. And basically you'll say if company and uh, the second or the third element is not null, create my company, return an HTTP 201. A lot of this is very easily Googleable. Um, it's very simple, straightforward code, but it's effective in terms of what it does. You get your information back and it's pulled straight out of a database. So these are the, the bones or the start, the structure of what could be a very well full featured uh, web interface or web service, should I say, as an interface for a backend database. Uh, you can use this uh, for your own uses. I've seen them used for vouchers inside apps. So if you want to give someone a free uh, copy of the app or unlock a particular feature in an app for someone, like a reviewer, you give them a voucher code, they punch the voucher code in, 
the app hits up your web service or your web server and says, hey, is this voucher code valid? So you do a, you just say a get and put the parameter on the end. So is this valid? And it returns a 200 or a 404 if you like. 200, yeah, or good, or no. That's very easily hacked. You could, you'd have to do some kind of authentication to sort that, but it's simple enough. Uh, you can also integrate your web service with other systems. So in my case where I was writing an app for a school, they needed it to integrate with their, one of their existing systems. I can't tell you much about it, but um, I had to integrate it with one of their existing systems. So I built a web service in front that talked directly into their database, the same database that their application was reading in and out of, and I suddenly mobilized their application. Because now I can have iPhone, iPad, Android, and web apps talking directly in and because you're putting that web front end on there, you can control exactly how they touch the data. So the integrity and your, the um, security of the data isn't compromised. So to bring it all back to iOS and Mac OS X, um, we'll look at some Cocoa. Web services with Cocoa. Now we've got three lovely little objects that Apple gives us, NS string, uh, NSXML parser and NSURL connection. I'll go through each of these and show you how you can use them to talk with web services and interact. Uh, and there are two third party uh, frameworks that I also like. They're not updated for iOS 5 or iOS 6, I believe, but they still work. They still work and they're very good and they're very full featured and they do what they're intended to very, very well. So, let's start with NS string. Uh, I, showed you this, I showed you this example before. NS string, uh, string with contents of URL. Um, basically, this does a very simple get on the location you pass in with an NS URL, and it dumps the contents into a string. So if you hit up www.auc.edu.au, you're gonna get the HTML of the website into a string, simple as that. You don't get any response code. Um, you do get an error. You have the option to place, it, place in a reference to an error here and you can read that out, but it's not all that detailed. You don't get the same uh, transparency you do with the response codes. So it works, but it's not that flexible. NSXML parser does what it says on the box, it parses XML. Um, I had a look at this framework when I was making an app as an XKCD reader. I didn't realize that there was a JSON framework for reading XKCD, and I decided to parse the HTML in my infinite wisdom. And that sucked, basically. Um, I don't like this framework because it has caused me uh, many headaches, um, but it is an asynchronous uh, object for parsing XML. So you give it an object and it will go and let you know when it gets to each part in the document. So it relies on delegates, which with the advent of uh, blocks and GCD and queues, um, this object could probably be improved very much with the addition of blocks. And as I said, it's not very flexible. But I'll look at a quick example anyway, because you sometimes do need to parse XML there are a lot of very large web services that still use it, and this is the Apple-provided framework for it. Basically, there are three ways you can uh, initialize an NS uh, XML parser. You can give it an, a, an NS data block, an NS data object, whether it be a string encoded into data, uh, an NS input stream, or a URL. It's got that same in it with contents of URL. Does pretty much what it says. Does pretty much the same as an NS string. You set the delegate to yourself, so you receive the callbacks, and you implement the NS XML parser delegate protocol, and you call parse. Simple as that. The method returns, and you wait for your delegate callbacks. Which is mainly these six: uh, document start, element did start. Element did end, found characters, error occurred, and yeah, document did end. Um, probably the most important one is the element, did start element, which gives you, among other things, a dict NS dictionary of attributes. Inside XML, you know how you have the triangle brackets and you have the 
element name, you then often have and key value pairs afterwards. So value equals my name. Those are attributes. Again, this took me a while to learn and work out, oh, that's what they mean by attributes. Because when I started structuring my own XML, why, I don't know, um, I could then read out those attributes rather than having to look at the text in between the elements, which sucked. As it parses the, oh, this is a little snippet of XML with a company. So see how I've got company ID equals one, two, three? That's a nice little attribute in there and it lets you identify the element before having to read everything that's inside it. So you know it's a company and within you're gonna find all the properties of the company with ID one, two, three. So basically it'll go through and it'll parse it and, come on, there we go. Um, it's gonna call each of these delegate methods as you go down. Did start, did end, did start, did end, did end, and then did end document. So you're gonna to have to handle at each point, you're gonna say if element of this type, then get this and do that. If element of that type, do this, then do that. Tiresome and it creates two or three pages of code for a very simple parse and it's not pretty. It, it really isn't. Um, so XML's there and it works, but it's not great. Um, I think it's sort of, it's definitely being phased out by JSON, which you'll see an example of in a minute. NSURL connection. This, along with three other classes, is Apple's way of letting you talk to the internet, uh, letting you fetch content. Uh, it's synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and it has a lot more options than in it with contents of URL. So there are three other objects that you're gonna need to use with NSURL connection. You're gonna need first an NSURL to specify your resource. An NSURL request, this gives you, you put your URL into the request and any other options. And then NSURL response. The response is where your HTTP response code and any other information is gonna be stored. So, quick example, if I do a synchronous request, now a synchronous request will block on its current thread and wait until the request is done or a timeout occurs and then it will unlock. So ideally you're not gonna wanna do synchronous requests on your main thread unless you're guaranteed it's gonna be split second, which you aren't ever. So try and put these onto another thread or chuck it in a GCD queue or something like that. What we're doing, I don't know if that's a little small for you guys, but I'm setting up the request URL, setting up the request, passing in my URL into the request. Um, the default method that Apple likes you to use now is um, NS request, NS URL request, request with URL, cache policy and timeout. Um, just the NS URL, requ NS URL request user protocol cache policy is just the default. I'm not 100% sure what that does. I've never needed to play around with it. Use cache? Use cache. There's like no caching policies and user cache policies and if local, if server-based cache policies, there's just user cache policies. Um, what options do you get to modify that caching as in how old or you don't get, yeah. It's a, it's a bit hidden really. They give you four different options I think and it's not all that clear what they do. But I'm just accepting the default here um, then you set up a response object and you call a class method on NSURL connection, which is send synchronous requests, pass in your request, pass in a reference to your response and an error if you want to. It snipped it off, but I've just said nil because I couldn't be bothered writing another line of code. Um, NS string, response string, uh, in it with data, request data, and I'm, because you get an NS data back, because you could be asking for an image, you could be asking for a document, you could be asking for a web page. So it's not gonna return a string to you. In my case, I know I'm getting some HTML, so I'll, unen I'll encode it, unencode it with UTF-8 string encoding and put it in the string and Bob's your uncle. Um, this will block on the line that starts with NS data request data. So until that request is complete, it'll block on that line. It works if you use that right. As I said, chuck it in an asynchronous GCD queue and pass in a completion block, you're all good. 
asynchronous requests, um, you've got two methods to do asynchronous requests. That first one with the red box um, relies on delegates. So you're going to get delegate callback saying, connection request did start, connection request did receive data, connection request did fail, connection, connection request did end. You'll get those appropriately. But while making these slides, I was very happy to discover that in iOS 5 and above, you get send asynchronous request, request on an NS operation queue with a completion handler, which is a block that accepts an NS response, an NS data, and an NS error as parameters. So then you can say, send this request, and here's a block to handle it. So it won't block your, the thread you're on, and you get to handle it dynamically based on the request you're sending. Um, there, did anybody go to the threads, GCD blocks talk? This is the kind of stuff that blocks is really, really useful for. Dynamic asynchronous events. So yeah, that's this one here, and that's iOS 5 and up. The top method's been available since the first SDK, iOS 2, so about the third version of the SDK. Um, so that second one uses queues and callback, callback blocks, which is much, much easier. All right, now onto the third party frameworks. ASI HTTP request, um, I really, really like it. There is so many features in this, it's not funny. This is what you'd expect. Um, you can do your put, post, and delete requests. Very, very simple, four or five lines of code for each. Uh, you've got download handlers, so you can pause and resume and cache downloads. Um, really what you need if you're pulling down large files and you, you'd like to pause it quickly if your operation gets interrupted. You can also hand that control over to the user, but then proxy it through to this class somehow. You've got progress tracking for downloads, user authentication, whether it be username, password, certificate, whatever and throttling and proxy support. So you can pull the proxy settings in from the OS or you can handle it yourself. Really, really very nice. Uh, and this is what URL connection request, in my opinion, really should have been. But nonetheless, we have this and we can do some stuff with it. So this is a post request with ASI HTTP request. Basically, you give it your URL with, with an NS URL in that first line, and you add post values. Now, as I said, post doesn't have the same parameter structure as a get. You don't have any question mark parameter equals value in the URL anymore. You pass these in through the header of the request. So simply, the key value coded those uh, line two and three there, you pass in your parameters. The third line there, you can also send data with a post. So in my case, I'm sending an image. And I believe on the other end, you catch that with the PHP input string. So this is a little bit of PHP code that'll catch that on your web server side. And so you can update information. In this case, I'm updating the company name and the company state with, yeah, with some proper values. Easy. It's a lot less code and you get the right functionality. Um, really good website, and it's some, there's some great documentation on how to do all of those features, and he's got some really good examples. Um, that post request example I pulled straight from his website and changed bits and pieces. Um, I've used this in a lot of my projects, and he happily touts on his website all the different other apps that already use his framework. Now, the framework hasn't been updated in about a year, um, as far as the date stamp on the website says, but it does still work on 10.8 OS X and iOS 5. I'm yet to try it on OS X, OS, iOS 6. You don't know, Lou? Okay. I know it works on OS 5, it's just not ARC enabled. Okay, yeah, it's not ARC enabled. Thus, the, the year old, it obviously can't be. Last third party framework, SB JSON. iOS, as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't it have any native support to parse JSON? It does since iOS 5, yeah. Okay, since it's iOS better. 5. This is better? Yeah. Okay. So How do you do it in iOS 5? Uh, when they brought in the Twitter framework, they also brought in uh, JSON frameworks for Twitter JSON classes. Ah, nice. Got to check those out. I've just been using SBJSON because it's worked for me for the last good couple of years, and I've had no, no need to uh, do otherwise. 
Um, simply, as I said, it, it does what it says in the box. It parses JSON. You've got a JSON, SB JSON parser object. You give it some text, and it'll give you back NS dictionaries and NS arrays. Oh, yeah, and the best thing about JSON is that it's quick. If you saw that XML we had before, that was a lot of braces and quotes and additional uh, non-data characters to represent that data. If you're looking at the company examples before, the only overhead was quotes and four braces, <coughs> whereas you had probably five times as many characters to represent that same data with XML. So you're going to be transferring less data, which on mobile devices is really important, and you can parse it quicker, which again, on mobile devices is really, really important. So this one's quite simple to use. You, I've, just for adding a bit of complexity here, I've chucked this operation inside a GCD queue. So I've asked GCD, give me a queue from the global queue dispatcher, and then I'm asking to do an asynchronous block operation on that queue. So the dispatch async bracket queue, oh damn it, I'm missing a round bracket and then caret curly bracket, and then you specify your code. And at the end here, I've got curly bracket, um, curly bracket semicolon, and I'm missing round bracket semicolon, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but basically what I'm doing here is I've got a string of some JSON. I just put some JSON string here. Um, you initialize a, a SP JSON parser object. You pass it in an object. So you say object with string, put in your string and it'll return you, it'll block, by the way, while it does it. It's not asynchronous, it's synchronous. It'll block on that line, and it will return you an NS dictionary. Blocking, in this case, isn't a problem because I put it on an asynchronous queue. It's not an issue. It's not going to block on my main thread. So it'll return you an NS dictionary. The reason it returns you a dictionary is, say we give it some code like this. Well, this is JSON. In JSON, you can specify multiple different enti entity types in one page of data representation. In this case, we've got companies, square bracket, and then two lots of round brackets. So I've got two companies represented here. So when, when I get that dictionary back, I'm going to get in that dictionary one entry. The key will be companies, and there will be an array of two companies. You can have multiple of these sections. Say you put a metadata section in at the top of this and say, Metadata is the name, and then you put in number of companies, two. You'll get a dictionary back from SBJSON parser. One will be metadata, will be key encoded against, and the other one will be companies. So it's really easy to break down your JSON into COCO data structures <coughs> and access the information. Then, because we get given an array of companies, I do some fastest iteration over the array, because it's an array of dictionaries. So you've got an array of dictionaries stored in the dictionary, if we follow that. Or basically, fast iteration over the array, pull out the values and print it to the console. Simple. Last but not least, I'll look at web service design patterns. Now, that's probably a little bit misleading. This is clients accessing web services. This is a design pattern I've used for my last couple of educational apps um, where I've needed to talk to my own web services. This is based on my experience, and it seems to work for me. Uh, you can give it a try. I'll augment it for yourself. Um, but it's up to you whether you want to use it or not. But basically, it has a client controller web service type structure. And as usual, I need a nice pretty diagram. Uh, client talks to the controller. Controller talks to the client. Controller talks to the web service. Web service talks to the controller. So if you look at here, you've got the opportunity with the controller in the middle to make this really quite flexible but be quite powerful at the same time. So in terms of the client, it has a many-to-one relationship with the controller. So you can have multiple clients talking to your controller. <coughs> when I say client, I mean an NS table view controller or an NS collection view controller. It could be your clients. Or it could be another class of yours that simply requires some data, whether it be, say, an authentication class. But the important thing is the controller should always talk to the client in terms of model objects. If we're all um, in with the model view controller paradigm, I'm talking models, models. You should have a data model to represent each entity your app deals with, whether it be a data entity or <coughs> some other type of abstraction. 
you should always be talking in models. It just makes the communication process much easier. Uh, and the client contains your main application logic, whether it be showing the table view or that kind of thing. Then we have the controller. Now, the controller both <coughs> deals with requests from the client as well as uh, requests to and from the web service. The controller will only expose methods to the client that the client needs in the context of this application. There's no point rewriting the whole web services interface on the controller if you're not going to use it. So this gives you a nice level of, of abstraction and it means that you can have your web service class um, be a true representation of the web service without having to write all the additional code in your application. Basically, the controller um, is the proxy between the client and the web service. Being the proxy, you've also got a great opportunity to do some caching. Um, I read on the <coughs> Facebook blog, developers blog, with their new release of their native app, that they're using Cordata to do some very smart caching. If you light up the Facebook app now from sleep, your recent information is there. Whatever was on the app is just there. What they're doing is they're pulling that out of Cordata. And then, while, you're just, while you've got something to look at, they're pulling everything in from the web service. It also mean, it means it improves the user experience because there's nothing worse than the user just staring at a blank screen going, hmm, what's going on here? If, they give, if you give the user some content, yeah, it might be a bit old and some sort of indicator to indicate, yeah, don't worry, I'm loading, I'm loading the rest. Don't worry, I'm working, but I'm, I'm loading the rest. Um, it gives them a the sense that the app is actually working. Plus, uh, it'll improve the efficiency of your app. If the user's going back and forth between views, you're not requesting the same information from the web service over and over again. So that's where you'd implement that logic in the controller. Um, if you want to, you can also use the controller to augment the requests that come back from the web service, um, strip things out, that kind of thing. And lastly, the web service object. It has a one-to-many relationship with the controller, so you can have many web services talking to one controller and the controller would only implement the methods required for your application. So in this case, the controller is very application um, contextualized based on the context of the application. Um, the web service should probably be a true representation of your web service. This makes the web service class very portable. You can reuse it, move it from one app to another and just rewrite the controller for your app. Uh, the web service will deal with all the requests to your web service uh, so this is where you'd implement your ASI HTTP request and all your JSON parsing because this really should deal with the information coming back from the web service and abstract it to a, a, model, a model object for your controller because it, it'll create a nice boundary between where you're at and the web service. Yeah, and it deals with all your other formatting type issues. So if the web service change, changes, you only need to change your web service class. And if you implement that class in another project, it changes across all your projects. Basically, the benefits of this, which I have really basically said already, is that it's really flexible, uh, it's low coupled, and it's easily reusable. Web, services, web service changes, just change your website, uh, your web service class. Um, you could also make it flexible. If you've got a really big application and you're talking to a couple of web services, write a couple of controllers and split the load across them. Otherwise, if you've got four web services you're talking to, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, um, Flickr, et cetera, et cetera, you don't want all that code put into your controller. Maybe use one for social handling and one for image and data handling. And that just allows you some nice separation and it makes the code prettier and easier to maintain. Other than that, uh, this has worked really well for me, and I've used it twice, three times now, and I haven't come across many problems. It's a, it's a nice architecture. And lastly, has anybody got any questions? I've got about five or ten minutes left. Is there anything you'd like to know more about? Yes? No? Okie dokie.
Yeah. One thing I should have said is whenever you make an API of any sort, document it as you go. Because if you've got this fantastic web service that works with your app and only you really know how it works, someone comes along and says, oh, I've made this great app and I'd love to integrate it with your, with your web service. You're like, hmm, okay. Um, I could spend a day or so writing this all down for you. It's much easier if you've got a document you've got as you go and you just say, here, go for your life. These are all the URIs you can hit. These are the parameters you can pass. Just for um, shits and giggles, go and have a look at the Facebook and Twitter APIs. They've got some really, really good documentation on those. And you'd be surprised how much information you can pull out just by hitting your web browser at one of those links. As I said, it was about two or three pages of JSON came out just for my screen name. You wouldn't realize there were that many properties stored against the user. Really, really useful stuff. Um, other than that, thank you very much, everybody.